Hi, everyone, and welcome to the AI Hardware Show. I'm your host, Ian Cutris, and join me as always, Taiwo Foxton, E Times. Go like and subscribe to her stuff. Get, get, it's better get, than get, your get, stuff. <laughs> Ooh, them fighting words. Those high words. In this show, we speak about AI hardware, the big stuff, the small stuff, the established players, the startups, the ones we like, and yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody. 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 Well, I was going to say the ones we don't like, but that well, the ones that are, the ones that are already gone, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, and that's where this episode is going to start. You know, rest in peace, Silicon. Well, you know, nom nom nom. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to start this episode with a product that will rest in peace. Oh. The AI hardware market has a large number of players, and we're going to see a sizable number of them fail to gain wide traction. Some of them will be acquired, some will disappear, and some of them will do both of those. And one example of that is Intel's Spring Crest. Intel has acquired several AI companies over the years. First, Mavidius, then Nirvana, and most recently, Habana. Mavidius still exists, just about, with their Intel Keenbay product, and we'll probably touch on that on the later episode. And we covered the latest Greco inference accelerator from the Habana acquisition in this series. However, the Nirvana product lines are all dead, as far as we know. Springcrest was a second generation design from Nirvana. Coming on top of the Lakecrest neural network processor, which was in 28 nanometers, Springcrest was the updated version of that neural network processor for learning, and so was given the title NNPL. If you search for NNPL, you'll find this product. It was based on TSMC 16 nanometer for a big 680 square millimeter die. It was focused primarily on doing convolutions and matrix multiplications, with a focus on as many matrix multiples as possible. This means you have to keep it fed. And as a result of that, it has 32 gigabytes of HBM2 for large 4K by 4K by 4K matrices. The architecture meant that with sufficiently large matrices, the same value could be used thousands of times for only one memory fetch. The goal here is to minimize the power consumption and latency inducing memory excesses, and each part of the architecture was built to do that, relying on a compiler to enable large static scheduling for higher utilization. When Spring Crest was debut, using BF16 quantized number support, Intel was showing up to 2x the utilization compared to Nvidia's V100 with large matrix multiples. The chip was also designed scale, with 16 custom interchip links for glueless scaling cable of 3.5 terabits per chip and up to 8 to 250 chips in a single system. So why did it fail? Well, people left the team, feedback wasn't great, and there's an ideal size for matrix multiplication in modern machine learning. You can't simply just build a bunch of multiply accumulate units and hope that does the job. Even though machine learning compute problems have grown in terms of parameters and complexity, it didn't grow in this direction. On top of that, Intel just bought Habana and felt like it was the better proposition. We're going to see a lot more companies go, go the same way. way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think we're already starting to see that to be honest with you. Oh dear. Okay, so far on the show, we've spoken about CPUs, GPUs, NPUs of all kinds. So far, we haven't touched on FPGAs. Let's put that right. While FPGAs have been used to accelerate number crunching workloads, including AI, for a long time, for AI specifically, FPGA makers have released heterogeneous hardware where they combine programmable logic with hardened CPU and MPU blocks on chip. The idea is to offer more flexibility than GPU, better optimized than CPU, but better performance than using the programmable logic alone. Xilinx calls its version ACAP, Adaptable Compute Acceleration Platform, which is a combination of adaptable hardware, which is programmable logic, scalar engines like CPUs, and intelligent engines like AI accelerators or DSPs. Different Xilinx ACAP parts have different combinations of these elements tailored for different applications, and there are hardened blocks doing things like connectivity and security as well. In between the blocks is a multi-terabit network on chip for data transfer between the blocks. Xilinx hardened AI engine is an array of computing tiles. Get ready for acronym salad. It's, each one is a VLIW SIMD vector processor alongside instruction and data memories. There are 256 intake max in each tile, and there may be up to 400 of these tiles 
in each versal AI core chip, which is up to about 200 tops at Intate. There are actually two flavors of this AI engine. One is more for signal processing or more like DSP workloads, beamforming, radar, FFT filtering, but it can also do AI. The other version is more general purpose for machine learning. So it has more vector extensions and fewer DSP extensions in the core. It also has twice as much data memory in each tile, plus dedicated memory tiles in between the compute tiles. Overall, the AI engine in ACAP devices is targeting low latency inference, not training, and will go into data centers and networking infrastructure. On the software side, Xilinx has Vitus. It's a platform designed to make ACAP accessible to hardware developers, software developers, and data scientists alike. So no need to learn Verilog. Nobody wants to learn Verilog. Does anyone still learn Verilog? <laughs> VHDL? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You don't have to. I don't know. There's, I think that's a big adoption problem with FPGAs. It's just the barrier to entry is so high. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, It's still true now. Yeah. yeah. We'll touch on that in the podcast. If you didn't know, after every episode, we do a longer form podcast, more free form, less scripted, where we actually you know, tell, us, tell you guys our thoughts on some of this stuff. So stay tuned for that. So my next chip is the Qualcomm AI100. Because Qualcomm has its own data center inference hardware. Yes, it's true. While the company has a smartphone processor machine learning implementation, the AI100 is the holistic successor in that it has learned from the smartphone side, but is in fact a distinct separate architecture built from the ground up specifically for enterprise workloads. Showcased at Hot Chips in 2020, the AI100 is a 7 nanometer inference chip built for edge applications. The smallest version uses an M.2 like form factor at 50 tops for 15 watts or 200 tops at 25 watts. There's also a big version at 400 tops, which is a PCIe single stock card for 75 watts. And that competes against the likes of Nvidia's T4 and similar designs. The big card has 16 AI cores and supports precision modes from FP32 down to INT8. And that 400 tops number is at INT8. It also has 144 megabytes of SRAM as well and 300. Uh, 332 gigabytes of onboard LPDDR4. Qualcomm states that it doesn't need HBM for the bandwidth because of all that onboard SRAM. Some other companies made that claim as well. The card has had good traction with multiple vendors offering solutions built on top of these cards. This includes software support for formats like Onyx and frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, Cafe, and Paddle Paddle. Qualcomm initially offered the AI100 as part of an Edge AI development kit something that looked like a Wi-Fi hotspot, featuring a Snapdragon 800 series mobile processor, the AI100 chip, and a 5G modem, allowing customers to develop solutions that needed AI acceleration. Benchmarks on the AI100 from Qualcomm at launch were fairly limited, sticking to industry standard tests like ResNet, which isn't that relevant anymore, but we've seen updates with BERT on MLPerf v2.1, which is more in line with modern workloads. That being said, we haven't heard much about the portfolio since the commercial distribution at the start of 2021, and we haven't really seen any roadmaps to speak of. Every year, Qualcomm does its uh, Qualcomm Tech Summit in December. I went to the one December just gone, and no mention. So we'll see. Yeah, it's like it's, uh, it's fallen off the face of the earth, kind of. It's still on the website. It's still there. They're still making it. Still making it. OK, when is compute in memory not compute in memory? When it's memory and compute. <laughs> when it's in, in memory compute. <laughs> when it's compute in capacitors. Ah. US startup NCharge, who just came out of stealth at the end of last year, have been working on something a bit different. Analog compute using capacitors. Usually when we say analog compute, we're thinking of compute in memory, like Mythic and others have done, using memory cells as an array of variable resistors. NCharge is using the same basic idea, but with capacitors. So instead of V equals IR, it's Q equals CV. The problem with using memory for analog compute is it's very sensitive to device mismatch. Any slight variations in the properties of each transistor can be fatal. They can also be very sensitive to variables like temperature. Most computing memory schemes use complicated calibration and noise compensation to get around this, and Charge's capacitor scheme doesn't need it. Capacitors are relatively simple structures whose properties are more tightly controlled and predictable through manufacturing. This concept was originally funded by a grant from DARPA and it's been developed at Princeton University over the last six years. NCharge has several generations of test chips and has demonstrated more than 150 tops per watt for int 8. It's insane. It's insane. It's an order of magnitude above other best-in-class options right now, including other analog compute schemes. 
and charges product when it comes will go into edge devices and most likely anywhere that's extremely power sensitive. 150 tops for what? It, 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 it's a weird metric because if they're only operating a microwatts. Yeah, it's still maybe quite small, but it's yeah. very impressive that I, that made me sit up, definitely. But yeah, with, with that, it makes me think, what happens if you stack it? As with all these analog and optical compute, where's the 3D? Show me the 3D. We'll, we'll come to that in the, uh, in the second part of the show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Alibaba's NPU, the Huanggang 800, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, was launched in 2019. The hardware company said replaced 10 of its internal GPUs for one of these MPUs, with also half the latency and a third of the power. The chip is built for data center inference acceleration, focused on convolution acceleration, and while programmable, was optimized for computer vision tasks, such as classification, object detection, segmentation, and point cloud creation. In 2020, I covered the architectural disclosures of the chip. It has no DDR, no HBM, but 192 megabytes of SRAM, four cores with a 200 gigabytes per second internal network, a command processor, multiple accelerator engines, and PCIe 4 interface. It's the accelerator engines where the performance comes from, tensor engines, pooling engines, and memory engines, supporting each stage of the compute process. One of the weird things about the Huanggang is that although it supported int 16 and int 8 processing, internally it uses a mixture of formats, such as FP24 and FP19, to maintain accuracy under the hood. The custom CISC-like architecture, according to Alibaba, was designed to take advantage of every different type of parallelism in machine learning that was possible at the time. Talking data parallelism, model parallelism, layer pipelining, hybrid parallelism, and multi-chip partitioning. That means that the platform required a strong compiler set, and that was built around Onyx, TensorFlow, and CAFE. Alibaba compares its 12 nanometer chip to the A100, claiming higher intake peak performance at half the frequency and just over half the power, also at a smaller die size. Though in this case, we're talking 709 square millimeters and NVIDIA's is somewhere about 800. With the device being enabled through a simple dual slot PCI 4x16 form factor, this card apparently scales from 25 watts to 280 watts with best in class latency for ResNet 50. This is a surprisingly consistent 0.11 millisecond regardless of batch size, which is normally something we see with a deterministic processor. And that's probably why there's no DDR or HBM. Huanggang 800 has been deployed extensively throughout Alibaba's internal cloud, although it's unclear about availability externally. Also, given when Alibaba did its technical disclosure in 2020, we haven't heard about any next-gen hardware at this time. Maybe soon. Maybe soon. Maybe soon. Korean chip startup Furiosa AI, obviously named after the Mad Max character, has been submitting MLPerf results for its data center vision accelerator since 2019. So while we don't know much about the microarchitecture, we have been able to track how much progress they've been making. Their chip, Warboy, great name. Great name. Great name. Is intended for computer vision inference in the data center and enterprise data center with a peak performance of 64 tops at in 8. This may seem a little underpowered for a data center chip, but it's intended to go up against the likes of the NVIDIA A2, that is an entry level servers where the application's confined by space and thermal requirements. We're talking about things like 5G, edge computing, and industrial gateways. Warboy's in the same power envelope as NVIDIA's A2, that is 40 to 60 watts, but the A2 is 36 tops compared to Warboy's 64. This means Warboy performs better on throughput for MLPerf's vision benchmarks, including object detection and image classification. Furiosa is also intending to compete with NVIDIA on price. Furiosa have said that Warboy currently supports more than 100 vision models, and it's deployed in the public cloud in Korea. The company also wants to target edge applications like robotics and autonomous driving. Furiosa has said that it's working on a next-gen inference chip with 10x the performance of Warboy, but what will they call it? Leave your suggestions in the comments. Witness. <laughs> Could be. It, uh, well, uh, it's a Korean company, lots of Korean telecom providers. Yeah, Mad Max win. Know, you heard it here see. first. There you go. <laughs> Many thanks for coming along on this journey through the AI hardware landscape. If you didn't already realize, we have a follow-on podcast after this episode. It's going to be posted the day after. Where is more freeform? And we're going to talk about the, uh, the things on our mind relating to all these products 
relating to the names of some of these products oh, in yeah, some oh, cases. Yeah. I, I think we're just going to have a brainstorming session of what people are going to call their next gen <laughs> chips. Uh, credit to the Korean companies to come up with that. Absolutely. At least they didn't call the company Furio Sai AI at the end, <laughs> which some other companies have done. Would have done. Insane. With yeah. the AI in capitals, just oh. to, to be clear. Or dot AI. Yeah. Oh, yes. Anyway, we'll come to some of those if we're not covered them already. You tune in for our rant after our this. Rant, yeah. rant. But as always, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.